Good morning, and welcome to St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church in Sarasota, Florida. My name is Justin, and we're so glad you decided to join us today. No matter what it may look like, we believe and know that God is in control. He is an ever-present help in the time of trouble, Psalm 46 and 1. And with the help of modern technology, we can gather virtually to praise, worship, and minister God's Word. If this is your first time tuning in, we would like to give you a special welcome. You could have picked any church's live stream, but you chose ours, and we thank you for that. Our mission is to share God's Word, whether it be in person at our church or virtually on your phone, tablet, computer, or smart TV. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and visit our website, www.saklc.com. Help us spread the word by sharing this with your friends and family. Thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it, and we appreciate you. Good morning, and welcome to worship. Uh, first of all, my heartfelt thanks to Pastor Nancy, um, who led worship here last Saturday and Sunday, uh, while Amy and I were off on our cruise, which yes, we thoroughly enjoyed, can't you tell, just by looking at the grin on my face. But joking aside, it, it is incredible and powerful and wonderful to be able to go on vacation and know that the congregation is in safe hands. Um, and I thank you for that, Nancy. And yeah. And thank you in advance for covering the parish in the next few days, because tomorrow Amy and I fly off to Baton Rouge to help our daughter move student accommodation from one end of Baton Rouge to the other end of Baton Rouge. I hear it, the temperature is beautiful and cool there, and it's a lovely, lovely temperature in which to move luggage and furniture. I'm sure we'll be fine. Yeah. But uh, thank you in advance, Nancy. And thank you to Eric Wogan um, for conducting funeral services here yesterday. Uh, when I left, uh, I, before I left, I was able to share prayers uh, with, the, with Dale Dreger and his family as death approached. Um, Pastor Nancy was able to offer pastoral care and Eric, as their beloved former pastor, was able to lead the funeral service. And for that incredible team of pastoral care, um, I give my heartfelt thanks. But that is also a way of asking you to keep uh, the family of Dale Dreger in your prayers and in your hearts. He was a longtime member of this congregation, known by many and missed by all. And so please keep his family in your prayers. The announcements of today are found on these green sheets. Uh, you may take the bulletin home with you. Um, it has prayers and scripture passages for you to read and contemplate in the coming week. But if you want to leave them behind to be recycled, that's great. But, 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 please take the green sheets home with you so that you know what's going on in this congregation. Because even though we are in the dog days of summer, there are still plenty of things happening and you'll only know about them if you tune in to the communication of which this is a part. So please take this home with you. And for a long time now, I've promised not to stand here and read this all out if you likewise promise to read this at home. So take it home and do so and you don't have to listen to me read every bullet point out to you. Now let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship.
please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sins. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ, and you make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence, that we may treasure your word above all else, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Please be seated. The first reading comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 18. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and wash your feet, and rest yourself under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they said, Do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah shall have a son. The word of the Lord. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. Whoever walks without fault, who does what is just and speaks, the truth from his heart. Whoever does not slander with his tongue, he who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. Who does no wrong to a neighbor, who casts no sir on a friend, who looks with scorn on the wicked, but honors those who fear the Lord. He who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord, who lends no money at interest and accepts no bribes against the innocent. Such a The second reading today comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. 
And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you have heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to Luke. Now, as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed her, him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So here we have this famous text, Mary and Martha. This is the only time we hear about those sisters in the synoptic gospels, you know, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three gospels that tell similar stories of Jesus, synoptic uh, looked at through a single eye. Uh, Mary and Martha do appear in John's Gospel, not one of the synoptics. John's Gospel is very different in so many ways. In John's Gospel, we discover where the certain place they lived was. It's Bethany. And we discover the name of their much uh, more famous brother, Lazarus, whom Jesus raises from the dead. Um, John's Gospel doesn't even hint at this encounter, and Luke's gospel, as you've just discovered, doesn't even hint at the resurrection of their brother. Two standalone stories in two very different gospels. There have been lots of interpretations of this gospel text over the years, many, many, uh, most of them wrong, in, in my not so humble opinion. Um, many see this as a feminist text. Uh, in my opinion, that diminishes how radical the text is. Because, yes, um, the sister is sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to Jesus' words, listening to the logos of the logos. 
And that phrase, sitting at his feet, is very deliberate and has meaning to it. It's the description of a student or of a disciple sitting respectfully and attentively at the feet of their rabbi or their teacher. However you interpret it, it's powerful because it's not a role commonly taken by a woman in that time and place. In that respect, it reminds me of Martin Luther and his beloved wife, Katie. Those of you who were raised Lutheran and remember confirmation class, you'll remember that some of Luther's writing can be a little dry, but you'll remember that table talk wasn't. Table talk is that anthology of all the sayings and pithy quotes of Luther recorded by students and friends as they talked over the dinner table, as home-brewed beer and homemade sausage galore came out of the kitchen, and the conversation went into overdrive. At that point, the women would leave, but Katie wouldn't. She would sit there and hold her own in the discussion between Luther and the other reformers. The other reformers came up with a nickname for her, the, the, the woman, the lady professor, which they meant as an insult. She didn't take it that way. She and Martin took that literally and said, yep, that's what she is. We know you mean it disparagingly, but boys, she can hold her own with you any day of the week and twice on Sunday. Luther might not have said that, but I may have added that for effect. The reason I say it's not a classic feminist text is that it's more powerful than that. In Christ Jesus, all of the distinctions fall away. We hear that in Paul and in those letters written in Paul's name by his scholars, by his followers. There are no longer distinctions in Christ for the sake of the gospel. There's no longer male or female, Greek or Jew, slave or free. The gospel has annihilated those boundaries that human beings spent so long and so much time and energy building up, they're all gone. So that the gospel is accessible to all, approachable by all, and to be shared by all. The distinctions no longer mount to hill of beans they're gone. The other way this text is misinterpreted is a sort of hierarchy, a sort of pecking order. Sure, doing stuff is important, you know, service is important, um, but not as important as getting the intellectual stuff right. You know, the sisters are divided along those lines in this kind of interpretation. Martha's the one busy doing stuff, and then she gets told off by Jesus for doing stuff, when her sister Mary, who sits and listens and learns, is held up of the, as the paragon of virtue. As if Jesus is saying, well, you either do good things or you listen to good things. Well, as Luther was fond of saying, Either or is a very rare beast. Both and abound. But this text is held up as that example of prayerful contemplation and study is so much more important than doing stuff. And that's wrong. And it's wrong for precisely the same reason that the truth will out. It's wrong because people latch on to two phrases. But if you understand those two phrases, you understand instantly A, why that's wrong, and B, what's really being said. And the two phrases come right at the end of the text. There is need of only one thing, 
and Mary has chosen the better part. Now you can see why people say, ha ha, there's need of only one thing, prayerful contemplation. And Mary's nailed it. But that's not what those phrases need, mean. Now, you've heard me time and time again uh, tell you the difference in translation of Greek words and phrases. I can't do it for this phrase because the whole sentence reveals the meaning. The whole Greek grammatical structure reveals the meaning. And if you think it can be boring hearing me talk about different translations, you ain't seen nothing yet. Just wait till you get me in front of a whiteboard and start to take a sentence structure apart. That'll have you sleeping soundly. Anyone who has trouble falling asleep at night or staying asleep, invite me over to your place. I'll talk about it until you drop off. But the way the sentence is structured in Greek reveals what the one part is. And the one part is the object, not the form. What's the important part? The important part is the object, not the form. The important part is the thing, not the way you get to the thing. The important part is Jesus Christ, not whether you listen to Jesus or serve in Jesus' name. Not the form, not what you do, but the who. The important part is Jesus. And at that point, Mary gives her undivided attention to Jesus, single-mindedly focused on Jesus, the one part that matters. Martha was focused on Jesus, The first reading reveals how important hospitality was in the ancient Near East. It's important now. I'm willing to bet that if I show up on your doorstep unannounced, you might not have me in for dinner, and I might have caught you at a bad time, but you're going to invite me in to chat, and you might give me a glass of water or a 12-year-old scotch, or maybe a 12-year-old scotch with a splash of water in it. But, but you will be hospitable, if at all possible, not because there's a law that says so, but because you want to be hospitable. Well, back then there were strictly enforced by society rules and regulations about showing hospitality. So Martha is doing her part. She's busying herself. She's showing immense hospitality to Jesus right up to the point when she isn't. Right up to the point when she isn't. Jesus occupied her whole heart, and her single-minded task until she became more concerned about what Mary was or wasn't doing. At that point, the one thing became two things. It became serving Jesus and griping about her sister. until the point was reached when it was no longer about serving Jesus and only became griping about her sister. So much so that she broke the cardinal rule of hospitality, which is complaining about how busy you are to the guest you're supposed to be honoring. That's why Jesus tells her off. In fact, the words that we often translate as troubled, have a a more colorful way of being interpreted. You know how in English some words are just plain and simple, but some have a sort of colorful imagery? Putting oneself in an uproar is what one of those Greek words that we translate as distracted translates as. Martha has put herself into an uproar. But what about that other phrase, Mary has chosen the better part? Have I got a Greek word for you? Okay, so choose. There's lots of Greek words for choose. And there's a perfectly good, common, 
often used ordinary word that means to choose something because of a preference or convenience. You know, I'm going to choose that because that's what I like. Or I'm going to choose that because it takes too long to do that. So that's my choice. To choose something through preference or convenience. That's not the word that Luke uses. Luke uses a word that means to choose for a moral purpose. To choose for a moral purpose. To deliberately choose something for the good. She has chosen to listen to Jesus. To listen to the Logos of the Logos. That's why it's the better part. She has made a conscious decision to do what is right and she is single-minded in the doing of it. What's that to us? Brothers and sisters, politics. I've spoken before. Sadly, I'll have the opportunity to speak again. And I speak now about the destruction of our country and of the body politic and of civil society. Martha put herself, placed herself, in an uproar. Jesus didn't do it to her. Mary didn't do it to her. She did it to herself. The uproar was of her doing, of her choosing, because she allowed what was otherwise a beautiful moment to become instead a moment for division, and bitterness and hostility, which explodes. And remembering the hospitality rules of the ancient Near East, explodes in her castigating the guest. Jesus, you're going to let her keep doing that? Tell her. I think of the way we divide ourselves. I know. I don't mean the way we decide, divide ourselves between left and right. There is always a version of that. Change the names of the political parties, change the language, and it's the whole world over and throughout history. We will each of us have different philosophies of life. We will each of us have different theologies of ways of thinking and speaking about God and engaging with God. And when it comes to public policy, enacting our political philosophies into real world actions, when it comes to public policy, we're always going to disagree. There's nothing new there. And we're not made to simply sing kumbaya with each other. It is good to disagree sometimes. Vive la différence. But when the difference becomes hatred, when it becomes all or nothing, when the lines are so sharply drawn that you don't simply differ from the other person, but hate them for what they think, what they believe, and what they do, when you make of them some faceless other so that you now have carte blanche to disregard them, despise them, or do away with them. If you divide families and churches along political lines, if you think your favorite politician is your savior, if you think your side can only do right and the other side could only do wrong, if you think that you have nothing in common, not even a shared humanity, then you've placed yourself into an uproar. 
you have placed yourself into an uproar. Because as my old Scottish mother would say, you're all the man and woman you're ever going to be. You know? We're not children anymore. We once knew how to play in the sandbox together. Life has shaped us. We've had experiences. We have knowledge. You're all the man you're ever going to be now. You're all the woman you're ever going to be now. You're all the person you're ever going to be now. We should know better, but we have placed ourselves into an uproar. And meanwhile, the Lord of Lords and King of Kings calls us, speaks to us words of grace and love and hope beckons us into a future that is His and that He gives to us. And meanwhile, we bicker and scoff and smite each other. Our problem is bigger than a do we, do we engage in service or prayerful contemplation. The answer as the title of the sermon suggests is not either or, but both and. Can we be good Democrats and love Republicans? Can we be good Republicans and love Democrats? Can we be good Americans before we're good Republicans or good Democrats? Can we be good Christians before we're even good Americans? Can we love Jesus Christ with a single-minded determination so that everything else, no matter how important it seems in the fleeting moments of our lives, we ultimately realize don't matter a jot compared to things like love and grace and mercy and kindness and respect and honor and care and nurture and support and self-sacrifice all before party, all before blue or red, even all before red, white, and blue, there is the cross of Christ. Not either or, both are. Not service or prayerful contemplation, but service and prayerful contemplation. And a healthy measure of humility on the one hand and mutual respect on the other, modeling the Christ who comes into our hearts as the eternal guest. Amen.
Together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. By the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray to God our Father in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord, making intercession for the church, the world, and for all people according to their needs. Lord, thank you for the gift of hospitality. You let us entertain angels unaware. Give us generous hearts so that we may refresh and gladden the hearts of others. Fill us with your spirit so that by faith we may gratefully receive the hospitality of heaven given to us in your well-beloved Son. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help the people of this congregation to rightly balance the loving hospitality of Martha with the loving listening of Mary. Let all we say and do be to lead our neighbors to the one thing needful, the strong saving love of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray for our nation, for our leaders, and for all the people and nations on earth. Let your holy presence dwell with us. Grant that we may know your will and seek your peace. Teach us to sit at your feet, to love your law, to display your mercy, and to share your blessings with one another. Lord, in your mercy. Be the light and salvation of all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially Chris Berkeley, Bill Butaji, Alan Morrison, John Numrich, Lauren Ross, David Ross, Barbara Russell, Mary Ellen Shoup, Dave and Linda Worley, Greta, granddaughter of Bruce and Jackie Model, the people of Ukraine, and the victims and their families in Highland Park. Strengthen their bodies, refresh their hearts, take away their fears and give them peace. Bless all who care for them with kindness and competence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our departed loved ones who now receive that good portion that shall never be taken from them, especially Dale Dreger, Arliss Jepson, and Norma Malcolm. Help us to comfort those who mourn Help us to nourish all who hunger for food, fellowship, or forgiveness. Help us to grow in faith, hope, and love. Welcome us and all whom you have redeemed into your spacious house. There, let us no more be strangers, servants, or guests, but your dear children who see you face to face forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. In the power of the Holy Spirit, we entrust our prayers and petitions into your hands, gracious Father, for the sake of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Please, Please be seated. seated.
arms touch him and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to For us a plentiful harvest, as we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field, and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all, in the name of Jesus. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Saviour Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Mighty and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In Christ's presence, there is fullness of joy. Come to the banquet. Please be seated. See on us. 
Please stand. Let us pray. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now the God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you, comfort you, and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Love your neighbor. Thank you. 